Hi, Hi and welcome, welcome to another, another edition, edition of, of our WebQuay Supply Road live streaming sessions. My name is uh, Don Parkinson, and I'm the consultation lead uh, for SNC Labo and the company, pro company providing the technical support to the WebQuay Supply Road uh, environmental assessment and preliminary engineering. My co-host today is Mr. Michael Fox, project facilitator for the WebQuay Supply Road project. How are you this fine evening, Mike? I'm doing good. I had a good cup of coffee there earlier, and I'm ready to go. Me too. Yeah, funny how uh, you know we both had good cups of coffee. It's a <laughs> recharge for this evening uh, performance. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, yet another really interesting study. Our team started this past winter, like the uh, like the Wolverine study that we talked about last week. Uh, the focus of the study is on an animal that's very important to community members, and that's. Uh, Boreal or woodland caribou. Um, and with us today is our special guest, Holly Dodds, who is an experienced wildlife biologist is, who works with our team. Holly's done all kinds of different projects in lots of different and interesting places. She led the sort of design of the study and managed the work associated with it and was in the field doing it too. So she's been, um, she's been involved, uh, stem to stern. So, uh, Holly, long time no see. No welcome kidding. To, welcome, <laughs> welcome to today's session, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us, even though you're on the road, and uh, get ready for uh, lots of questions. Sounds good. Excellent. Um, Mike, do you want to uh, uh, have the honors of kicking things off with the first question? Sure. Uh, welcome to the show, Holly, and... Uh, <laughs> Um, I think uh, let's just start from the beginning, uh, Holly, and, and uh, maybe tell us why we're studying caribou as part of the Webaquay environmental assessment, or Webaquay Supply Road environmental assessment. Sure. So as part of an environmental assessment, we're looking to kind of identify, describe, and measure effects on different wildlife that occur in the Webaquay area. Um, caribou are definitely an important animal to the community, and they're also uh, threatened in the province of Ontario. And so on this project, we're looking at woodland caribou, and we're looking at a, it, they're called forest dwelling boreal caribou. And so when I talk about caribou, that's what I'm talking about. And I'll, I'll try to be clear when I'm talking about uh, different populations. And so um, it's, it's important to look at caribou so that we can understand um, their movements in the area and the different habitats they're using. And the range that's, that we're focusing on for our project is the Misisa range. So um, it's a group of caribou occupying and using different habitats, about 70,000 kilometers squared area. So Holly, just one quick question about that. Like, do they, so yeah. that, that group of caribou stay typically within those range approximate range boundaries is that more or less correct would you say yeah more or less so it's the range is kind of the area that's important to that group of animals you might get some caribou moving between ranges and that's how we see some uh, genetic diversity and gene flow uh, but but most of the time it, it's kind of characterized by uh, a, a group using this distinct unit okay Oh, that's good. Thank you. Um, yeah. So maybe maybe you can tell us um, uh, about the work or, or meaning studies to a large extent that's been done to date on boreal caribou. I mean, our team has done quite a bit over the last few years and even before the Webquay Supply Road EA. Um, uh, so if you can describe sort of the, that work for us and then maybe mm -hmm. talk about what's been learned from, from those different different studies in general? Yeah, so I guess I'll start with the Webaquay Supply Project. Um, we've completed aerial surveys in the past, and I think we've had some other team members on uh, chatting with you guys about that. Uh, and that's kind of looking at uh, population demographics. So uh, we're looking at how many males, how many females, how many calves, and just getting an idea of how many animals are occurring in the area. Uh, I know, so I... I haven't been involved, but I know that both the province 
help characterize the ranges of caribou. And so the province has been working for many years. Um, they've got collared animals already out there. They're doing flights. And I believe the feds, they were in the area actually when we were up this year, uh, collecting fecal samples, which would have to do with uh, defining populations by um, genetic profiles. So hmm. yeah, there's, there's a lot There's a lot of study that's been done so far on, on the caribou in the Webukwe area. You know, that's that's interesting, Holly. I know, and I know talking to community members too, they're involved in a, uh, they were involved in an MNRF uh, collaring study last winter, I believe. And I know they're also involved in their own study uh, as well, which is going to run into next winter as well too. So we're just learning about that as well. So lots of activity uh, going on when it comes to woodland caribou, for sure. Um, this may be a hard to answer question, but... Uh, what, you know, what have we learned from the uh, I think one thing that the province has able been able to refine are those, um, those ranges that I described. And I kind of wish I'd sent you guys a picture because me talking about it isn't going to do it justice. Uh, but the forest dwelling boreal caribou, they kind of span the boreal forest in Ontario, and they're broken up into these multiple distinct ranges. Uh, and so I think like the province has been doing a really great job of characterizing the, the different populations within those ranges and also figuring out what sort of the, um, the stresses to caribou in those areas and like what, what the potential impacts um, are and what, what, you know, could be, impacting caribou in those areas and working to develop management plans uh, in consultation and partnership with the different communities on on how to best manage the the herds in those areas. Hmm. Um, just one follow-up on there. Given all the, the, the previous studies done to date, um, why is a why is a GPS collaring study uh, being done? Where does this fit in? Like, can you give us a bit of the genesis of uh, of, of you know how we got to this point yeah so as part of this project we have a lot of meetings with the regulators and initially we'd started out with the transect survey approach to kind of characterize the the caribou in the area and uh, in consultation with mnrf mecp ecc that's a bunch of acronyms but government people who what do, do they stand for again holly <laughs> just yeah, just a, uh, I'm not. It's not a skill testing question. I just, just for our viewers, anyway. I'll, I'll pass. So it's uh, <laughs> as in I'll pass the test, not I'll pass on this question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so MNRF is Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, MECP is the Ministry of Environment, uh, Conservation, and Parks, and E Triple C or E C C C is Environment. Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, there, I got there. You passed the test. Well done, Holly. <laughs> yeah, and so now I forget where I was going with oh, that. But sorry, yeah. we, all, <laughs> we all work together uh, to come up with, with a, a program that um, they felt fit better into some of the studies that, that they were working on to date and that would complement the data collection. And it's all just meant to to do our best to understand how caribou are moving in the area and how they're using different habitats um, with respect to where the road is being proposed. And, and you know, it, you, the aerial surveys are great, but this reveals so much more, doesn't it? As we we'll learn, yeah. you know. It does. Yeah. It reveals a lot more. I was just, I was just curious, uh, Holly. Um, you know, as a wildlife um, biologist uh, who's done um, a number of things, how um, does working with the boreal uh, caribou GPS collaring uh, study rank in terms of some of the other work you've done in your in your career so far? <laughs> Mike, I, I don't know if I should say it, but I think it's all downhill from here. <laughs> That's that's to say that this has definitely been a career highlight. Uh, caribou is not how I got started in this 
in this game. Um, just over the past couple of years, I've been getting more involved and then had the opportunity to lead this study and work with an amazing group of colleagues and, and partners. And yeah, this is, you know, for any wildlife biologist, this is a rare opportunity and it's such a privilege to be able to, to support the community with this work. Right. Well, uh, let's step back a bit and maybe you can help uh, tell our viewers a bit about boreal caribou or woodland caribou in general, maybe, you know, their, where they live, their habits, uh, etc. Definitely. So the forest dwelling boreal caribou, which are largely the animals in our study area, um, they, they have a bunch of different names, which is why I certainly get confused sometimes. Um, but one of the other names that they go by is sedentary caribou, which I think is really hurtful because the, the reason that they're called or the, that sometimes they get classified as sedentary is that they don't make the same grand movements as some of other caribou, um, such as the migratory caribou. And so largely the forest dwelling species stick within about a hundred kilometers um, in their different habitat mosaics. I'm not going to call uh, like walking a hundred kilometers. How they're defined across their range is, is they don't make those huge movements. And so we're looking at animals that that they require these complex, like mature coniferous forests um, alongside like kind of bog fen habitats. And, and they, they mostly stay sort of within the same area. And um, they use different habitat types throughout the year. Uh, so this winter, you'd find them mostly in mature coniferous forests. Uh, most of it has to do, I think, with uh, predator avoidance. And so there's, I mean, there's no bears in the winter, but there's less wolves in the mature forests in the winter. And um, in avoiding those early successional areas, they're avoiding spots where moose might be. And more moose equals more predators. And so you'll find that uh, the forest dwelling caribou tend to group up a little more in the winter. They might, you might see them in uh, bigger numbers, usually up to like 15 in a group, not as many as the migratory. Um, come spring, uh, when the females are ready to calve, they'll take off on their own. Uh, they're looking for really specialized habitats to have their calves. These are places with like high quality food, again, low predator numbers, and, and they want to get away from the rest of the herd so that that's also not attracting as much attention. Uh, during the sensitive period. Usually the nursery and calving areas are uh, like islands on lakes, or they might be like conifer dominated upland areas um, near bogs and fens, peatland complex. It's, it's, I, you know, I'm not a super expert on that. And that's actually one of the great things about the collaring survey is we're going to get to see uh, where they are at those times of year and get a bit of insight on, on especially in the Webequay area, what areas are important for, for baby caribou? Holly, we, we did a nursery habitat survey, didn't we, for caribou um, last year or the year before, I can't remember. Um, but that was a different kind of survey, wasn't it, right? It was more, was it more aerial and then with, with visits to selected areas? Yeah, so that one, it was aerial and then it was uh, foot surveys. And so the goal with that was, I, I think there are some known mapped nursing, nursery areas in the study area, but the goal was to potentially identify more. And so we looked kind of at that description I gave you earlier. We looked at those areas, so peninsulas, islands, uh, wetland complex areas, and we would do foot surveys and look for evidence of, of animals, uh, including fecal pellets. Um, and then try to try to infer from that the potential for for nursery or calving areas. And I, I think, you know, we we collected some information, but I, I think also with this collaring survey, we're just going to make it better. And maybe we'll confirm some of our initial thoughts from those surveys. Interesting. Um, one question for you. Uh, what do caribou eat? 
It's a good one, Don. <laughs> so they're veggie. So I guess they're vegan. Vegan caribou? Oh, yeah, I, I guess they would that. be, technically. Yeah. <laughs> I think we say herbivores. Uh, so kind of different things depending on the time of year. So if it's summertime, uh, they'll be browsing on on different items like grasses, sedges, uh, horse tails, and, and lichen. And I say lichen, that's actually one of their more important food sources during the winter. Uh, terrestrial lichen, so that's like ground lichen, and then arboreal lichens, which are lichens on trees. So yeah, and one of the reasons that they pick the uh, mature conifer areas during the winter, not only does it have to do with predator avoidance, but the thought is that there's less snow accumulating in those areas, which makes it easier to dig down to lichens. <laughs> ah, yes, <laughs> makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it, it's funny, it's funny, Holly. I remember looking at some of the photos taken at the Wolverine um, uh, run poles, and uh, I, apparently we had a few... Uh, intrigued caribou they were they were eyeballing i guess they weren't eyeballing the the bait then because that was meat right they were probably just uh, curious about that uh the highly involved in this caribou work as well and i don't know if he described um the the substance that we applied to the meat to attract to attract uh, animals <laughs> I, and it is he maybe didn't describe it because you guys would be making faces it's he said the, it was skunk like i think it's like didn't he oh, it's, I can't remember. it's worse than skunk it's <laughs> it's the it's the grossest smell and I, I can only imagine that the caribou are like what is this let's go look <laughs> <laughs> that's my my hypothesis i'm not sure they might have um you know we kind of trampled footpaths in when we were setting up the Wolverine stations, it could be they were they were curious about that path. Um, I, yeah, I didn't see any of them licking the the hanging meat in the photos. So, so as far as I know, they're they're still herbivores in that area. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they haven't switched over to the other side, eh? <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Holly, uh, I, I uh, went caribou uh, hunting with my daughter. Um, on the Hudson Bay coastline, and um, um, so we charted up there, and and, and my my cousins, um, you know, set you know, planned the whole thing out. But we, I actually shot one. Yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> and he was telling me as we were, you know, my daughter and I were dragging the the caribou out of the bush, and, and it was pretty heavy. And, and uh, but he was saying, "Oh, these are the these were the s smaller ones. Like the tundra caribou is actually smaller than the woodland caribou." And um, so I wanted to ask you, what is the difference between, um, you know, the the boreal caribou or the woodland caribou versus the tundra caribou? Sure, um, that's a good question, and it's a cool story. It's what a fun opportunity. <laughs> uh, so. So as I understand it, the, the boreal, the forest dwelling, are a little larger than, than the uh, tundra caribou. In Ontario, we've got, it's kind of like a, a tundra boreal like mix. It's still a woodland caribou, but these are the animals, those migratory animals that I was talking about. So probably those are exactly the ones you're talking about, Mike. Um, they, they typically move around the top part of Ontario coming, uh, like in the summer, they'll spend time in the tundra and then closer to winter, they'll start coming down to hang out in the boreal forest. And so something that was pretty interesting on this project is um, this year, we noticed compared to other years that there were so many caribou. And for everyone who's listening from Webakwe right now, um, we were even getting reports from community members that they were just like hanging out on Winnisk Lake, like just just lots of caribou. And one of the things that we think happened is that the, the migratory population uh, came down maybe a little further. Um, we hadn't seen that in the past couple of years. So I don't know. I don't know how much how much it happens or or if we just like hit hit a good time this year. Um, but yeah, so actually we're taking measurements and. Um, there was a little bit of chat about how the boreal population are the bigger, like 
bigger caribou. I'm not sure if it's it's by too much, um, mm-hmm. but but there's a lot of similarities between the two woodland caribou. I think the biggest distinction th- that I'm familiar with is it's the movement patterns that that separate them. Mm. But otherwise, they look almost identical, do they? Yeah, as far as I can mm. tell. I mean, I'm a wildlife biologist, not a, a super caribou expert, and I'm sure we've got some talented people. Oh, and especially like with our indigenous communities, people who can just like look and tell. It's not me, and I envy those people. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe you can tell us how you came up with the the study design. Uh, for the the collaring survey, uh, Holly, because it's probably um, it's probably an interesting story. Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> I, it it definitely wasn't all me. Uh, so it, it was definitely a, a bunch of teamwork. So we had our team at SNC Lavalin, and like I said, working with um, the regulators. So primarily those three groups I rhymed off before. And, and to be fully honest, a, a lot of it came from the regulators. And so, you know, we, we had ideas of how, how we'd like to see the project uh, go. And then based on their like extensive experience, they were able to, to build on our suggestions and they would give recommendations about uh, how many callers they'd like to see go out. And, and then we kind of worked together to figure out um, the, the least impactful way to get the most information. And again, it's largely based on their successes in the past with uh, their work in the province. Um, so we ended up collaring with was not working. <laughs> so, which was really frustrating, um, unfortunately. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit a bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, 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 that's interesting. How long is a study going to run for, Holly? And and do you... oh oh, you guys there? I can hear. Her. We lost visual. Oh, I, I can keep talking. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't touch any buttons, but anyways, <laughs> I, I think I was going to tell you how long the study's going for. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so this part of the study, which is the baseline characterization, which is just a fancy way of saying what's going on right now with the caribou before anything happens, um, it's going to be three years. So we're we're following these caribou for three years. Uh, Holly, um, I'm always interested in in um, regulatory processes. Um, you know, being the, the nerd that I am, um, <laughs> did you have to get permits to conduct the study? And and if so, can you tell us a bit about the process, including why these permits are required? Are there rules that need to be followed that are associated with these permits? Yeah, for sure. We, we did need to get quite a few permits, Mike. We started, I think, back in November trying to get them all together. Uh, we needed four, four permits in total, uh, three from the province and one from the feds. Uh, a lot of, like, one of the permits was exclusively focused on a- animal welfare. Um, and then the other permits were they hinged on that. So that was the first step. Uh, Once we got the animal welfare component um, sorted out, we worked on the technical aspects uh, to finalize the other permits. Um, The the federal permit was only required for work uh, closer to the community, whereas the other ones covered um, the the other lands a little bit a ways and, and east of the community. And so part of the reason that we, we do these permits and that we work with the regulators on them is, is that it, it helps provide a, a nice structure, not only for, for reporting on an annual basis, but for kind of keeping us as the proponent on track and heading in the right direction and making sure that if we were ever to hit any big roadblocks, that, that we'd have the ability to work with them 
through them. And it it is they're you know keeping an eye on the project, which is really what we want. Like we want to be able to engage with with the regulators and be like honest and upfront about how things are going. And they're also super curious. Like they want to know what's going on on the project, and and they're looking for updates. And and in some cases, they're also looking to provide like really valuable input. So. Yeah, it's mostly about a communication framework and just keeping us keeping us on track. Oh, that's interesting, Holly. Um, uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about how the coloring work is done and uh, and what's involved in 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 the, that work. I know it's a big question, but yeah, there's there's a lot to to I think dive into there. You guys still can't see me, can you? No, no. <laughs> you can hear you. Okay, <laughs> good, good. I'm still, I'm still smiling. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the collaring work was was really cool. So this is the first time I've been involved with a, a collaring project. Um, we started out. We bought thirty collars um, from a manufacturer in the states, and we we get these collars shipped to us in Canada, and then we have to sit down and program the collars so so they come kind of as blank slates and we need to tell them what information we want to collect and so it, it kind of like everything is an exercise in computers these days and this is this is just another exercise in computers um so so we program these collars to collect data points which is just where's the caribou at 6 a.m 9 a.m lunchtime 3 p.m., right? And so eight times a day, we get information on where caribou are. And then once a day, the caller sends all that information to a satellite, and then it goes onto the computer, which is pretty wild. Um, the way that they used to do these, they would collar the animals, and then they would have to fly around like at weekly intervals with, with an antenna to find them. And so now we're at this point where it just sends signals into the sky and we can know where the caribou are, which is crazy. Um, so <laughs> I mentioned to you guys that this is my uh, first experience on caribou collaring, but uh, what we did for, for this project was we engaged a highly technical team to do the work. Uh, we worked with Serge Couturier out of Quebec, who is a lifelong caribou biologist and has collared hundreds of animals in his lifetime. And him along with his partner, Jean-Yves Lacasse, partner in crime, let's say, <laughs> uh, helicopter pilot. Uh, he's also worked with um, Serge and he's, he's participated in, in the capture of over 500 animals as well. Yeah, so we brought those guys in from Quebec and um, they helped us with the program. They were they were our experts. So uh, Don and Holly, uh, we actually got a, a few questions from Facebook. Ooh. So um, this is quite a, a lengthy one or a prelude to it. So um, the question is: Do you think the woodland sedentary caribou share part of their range with the migratory tundra echo type? In the Webaquay region, because this is about the approximate limit between the two echo types in Ontario, right? So that's the first question. The second question is Do you think that radio calling will help answer this question about which echo type caribou is found in the Webaquay region? I love those questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that um, that person is is right, like on the right track. It, it's it is like Webaquay is right near that that split between the Hudson Bay lowlands and and the boreal area, and I think they're exactly right. I think we're we're on the edge of both both populations, and I do hope that the collar surveys um, will help us understand uh, a, a little bit better which which populations are in the Webaquay area because you know um, the the migratory populations. They aren't threatened like the boreal, the forest dwelling, but they are also at risk. 
And re regardless of which population it is, we, we care about caribou on the project. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think... speak, it, 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 sorry, I was just going to ask you, are, are yeah. we now able to track the collared caribou in real time now? Yeah, yeah, we are. I, I just saw a picture, like, I see a picture of me with my sister up now. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. Can, can Not sure how that got there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so we're able to track um the caribou in real time now. So like I said, the, the satellite sends the signal and, and there's actually a website that we can access to find out the locations. Um, admittedly, I'm not watching it every day, but we do download the data and we're certainly we're excited to uh to kind of dig in, dig in eventually, um, and and hopefully uh, for for the benefit of the the community and for the people interested in the project, it would be so great to get some like visual representations up about some of the movements that we're right. seeing. Um, I can tell you, uh, I did peek, I peeked at it a couple days ago, and which was the first time since we did the collaring, and. Um, we we have some animals up in Polar Bear Provincial Park right now. Wow, really? It's amazing. That's I mean that's what two hundred kilometers plus north of of Webequay, isn't it? It's got to be. I'd have yeah. to get my ruler out. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, two hundred to three hundred kilometers. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. Wow. So maybe they were migratory. Yep. Yeah, it that kind of that points towards that. Yep. Interesting. That's that's really interesting. So, I mean, it's amazing now. Eh? Like I, I remember working on a project uh, 15 years ago where they did radio collaring in in Labrador, and uh, you know, with the big antenna, and that was a lot more effort um, than being able to get data dumps via satellite. Eh? Which is it's some incredible the difference. The technology is remarkable. It's it's truly. Insane. And you know what? I just I'll branch off like really briefly from caribou. They have made these these telemetry, these these tiny GPS things so small that I have seen them put them on bumblebees. Wow. <laughs> I know this is a caribou talk, but but people are out there tracking bumblebees. <laughs> that is incredible. That's, that's, I know. Uh... Well, have we not put them, have we not been involved in projects where we put them on turtles? We have put them on turtles, yes. We have, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Those are pretty small, to... too. Yeah, you're right. Those yeah. are pretty impressive. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got another question for you here, Holly. Um, you know, what? this has got to be a bit of a stressful experience for a caribou to be captured. And um, Can you give us an idea of, of you know, sort of, um, you know, Given what's involved in this, like how much stress you know, is put on the animal and maybe some of the things that are done to alleviate, you know, to sort of lessen the, that stress? Yeah, for sure. Maybe what I should do, I should describe kind of um, what what it's like when we when we um, kind of pursue and capture a caribou. Like we're, we're flying in the helicopter. Uh, there's a net gun involved. And, and we're capturing the caribou in a net and then processing them. And so there is definitely some potential for stress there. I mean, how, how could there not be? But yeah. the things like we, we try um, as much as we can to minimize that stress. And what that looks like is making sure like you're timing your chase time and you cannot exceed a certain amount. So yeah. you cannot, you just can't chase that animal for too long. And yep. so we're just we're making sure that we're keeping chases short. Yes. Um, and to be honest, like you will you'll just leave like if you chase too long, just you're stopping. Right. And so it's it's knowing when to make that call. And yep. that's relying on our expert, which was Serge Coutelier and his experience to know when to call it. Um, yes. There's there's also stress associated with the processing. So once we catch the animal and um, free it from the net. We, we try to very quickly process the animal. Um, and so what that looks like, it's, it's using an eye blind, which helps keep them calm. 
And it's just the faster that you can get your job done, the better it is for the animal. And so we we worked as a well-oiled machine <laughs> to to quickly <laughs> process animals and to get them out and back into the forest. Uh, Holly, maybe um, our technical team can can show a, a video just to give uh, people a better idea. Um, okay, so I think I think we have that video clued up, uh, queued up. Do we? Just uh, checking. Wow, great I, video. Great I, video. Wow. Great video. And, and I guess, Holly, um, that that could be contrasted from the old ways, I guess, when you're when they used to tranquilize them. Right. Yeah. And so I've I've never worked with uh, tranquilizing the animals, but I do understand that the way that we do it now is much less impactful to their to their short term and long term health. So yeah, so without the tranquilization, I think they have a much higher rate of success. Right. So so when you capture the animals, and, and again, I love those clips. <laughs> um, very few people can actually, you know, that, uh, close like that, right, uh, and, and live. So, so when you capture the animals, Holly, um, what kinds of samples are taken from the caribou and what's the purpose of those samples? Yeah, um, so we, we actually take a, a number of samples as well as measurements of the animals. The measurements play into the, um, you, you mentioned it, Mike, the, the different uh, sizes between some of the populations. So it's, it's getting to, to learn a little bit more about what are the characteristics of the animals in our study area. Um, we also collect a number of biological samples. So we collect hair, blood, and fecal pellets. Uh, the hair samples, a couple of different uses for those. Um, one gets sent for cortisol testing. Cortisol, it's a hormone, and it, it's kind of, it's potentially indicative of, of long-term stress. So it's not about assessing stress of capture. It's about looking to see if they're, if on this individual caribou, um, throughout its life, it's it has experienced stress, and then we might look to the environment to see what's causing that. Uh, some of the hair samples with roots are are sent for um, DNA uh, extraction, and so those are sitting with the province right now. Uh, same with the fe the fecal samples. So uh, caribou release pellets, as I think probably everyone knows, sort of like rabbit deer. If you're in the south watching this. Um, and uh, fortunately, the the pellets are released um, during during the work, and so it's actually someone's job to 
to put on a glove and pick up the poops. And you know what? A lot of the time it was my job and it was a lot of fun. So, <laughs> so the, and the reason, the reason we pick up the fecal pellets, um, it also has to do with um, uh, extracting DNA and, and using that to inform um, some of the population genetic studies. That's also sitting with the province right now. They may also look at it for, for parasite load. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and oh, the blood samples. So, so we also drew blood samples just a little bit. And um, we had that sent for pregnancy testing. So because all of our animals were females, um, we, were, we were interested in pregnancy status. So I, I think I, I am able to share that all of the caribou um, that we captured were in fact pregnant. Wow, really? that's, that's good news. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it is good news. And I think it's, you know, in, in most years, it's it's to be expected. And um, it's it's more during during calving where, where you start to see uh, maybe not non-successful. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, complications yeah. and yeah, complications interesting. and predation. But yeah. Well, let me, I got another question here for you, Holly. Um, I understand the collars fall off after a period of time. Um, I'm curious how this is possible to happen. <laughs> Maybe you can help explain this. Yeah, totally. So this is another, I think, neat advancement in, in collar development, GPS collars. There is actually a release mechanism. So it's um, where we've got that one computer on the collar that's sending the the location data there's another i think i can still still call it a computer a tiny mechanism that we were able to program to pop off in three years so we we tell this little piece of plastic on the collar that it's going to pop off in 2024 march march 2024 and and it's going to do it <laughs> amazing that is amazing yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then what I, happens when the collars come off, Holly? You, do you come and yeah. you swing by and pick them up? Yeah, we do. Um, and that's mostly related to uh, not wanting to, to leave anything in the environment that, that shouldn't be there. And so we'll collect the collars because we will have all the data having gone to the satellites. It's just, it's good practice to pick them up. And so actually when we go to pick them up, we get back into the, I don't want to call it old timey way of finding things because we still use it to this day, but we use a, a receiver and an antenna to, to find where the collar is. Like we'll, we'll know generally where it is, but once you're on the ground, like who knows? And so you actually walk around with this antenna in your hand, listening to beeps from a receiver because the collars are emitting a very high frequency output. And so you're walking around just listening to beep, beep, beep. Mm. And then the louder it gets, the closer you are to your collar. Wow. Yeah. Uh, time saver, though, right? It's a time saver. Definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was, I was looking at that video, uh, Holly. Um, I see there's a number of people, you know, uh, there. Are, um, how many people are usually involved in a coloring uh, program and what are the roles? Yeah, so on our program, we had um, four people involved in most of the captures. Uh, so we've got the pilot, who is always a very skilled flyer. I've never seen such dexterity when you need to uh, when you need to be like so careful with the caribou, and then also right on top of the one that you're you're trying to catch. Uh, so the pilot there, and Sergio has said that the pilot was the most important job in the whole operation. I think Serge was pretty important too. So Serge was our, our net gunner, an expert. So when we saw that video, those were Serge's legs. And so Serge was harnessed into the helicopter. And I think you guys saw there were no doors on the helicopter. <laughs> he's sitting he's sitting half out, and it's his job to be um, releasing the net onto the animals. And so he has to have excellent aim and excellent decision-making skills. So he's supported by a third member in the back who will pass him 
another neck gun if he needs it and who will also be jumping out of the helicopter to to help um with the the caribou in the net and then there's on on our team we had a fourth person and they usually stuck to um collecting samples and taking notes and now i know um other teams uh in the project area did did it with um two people i believe uh, but we found i think we had good success with four and we, we were able to move really quickly which was nice holly uh just based on what you were saying there uh at what point do you take the doors off the helicopter you can't be flying <laughs> around without the doors on uh, when it's like minus 30 and uh, you're in Don, march Don, it's so cold it's so cold <laughs> without the doors <laughs> so so the way it kind of works um actually i probably should have mentioned this at the beginning is we did a few um transects we had another team out uh, running transects to find out where where the larger groups were, where the females were, and to to kind of feed that information back to the capture team. And even though we had that information, uh, sometimes you'll spend a little bit of time looking for animals. So usually what you do is you keep the doors on, so you stay warm when you're looking, you spot a group, it's big enough that you think there's some females in there, or maybe you can tell, uh, you'll come down, uh, helicopter stays on, you remove the doors, they get left. Uh, it's someone's job to remember to GPS where you left the doors, because <laughs> that's important. Um, and then you, you take off with, uh, with your net gunner out the door, and hopefully you're finding that group and they're not um, dispersing into the woods. <laughs> and then you might, you might spend... Um, I think we never really went more than 10 or 15 minutes with, with out the door on. It just, it gets so cold. And I wasn't even the net gunner, right? I'm in the helicopter and I was cold. Like, poor Serge. <laughs> so cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a, uh, well, what a process. Oh, no kidding. Uh, I was just, so I, I just wanted to get back to, um, the coloring, because I, I just thought of this question, you know, so there's the planned program to release. So like in three years, like you said, March yeah. 2024, it, it, uh, the, it will get released. So, but the unplanned, like do do the GPS callers fall off the caribou on, on their own? And, and does no movement, you know, of one of these things mean, um, you know, caribou has died or, or, or otherwise? Like, I'm just curious about that. The unplanned stuff. Yeah, good question. Um, so, so the way that the collars are are affixed to the animal is there. It's kind of with um, screws and nuts. So there's a couple. We we haven't heard of any collars falling off of the animals uh, in nearby studies, but. Honestly, it was a delicate balance getting, I think, the collars um, fitted on properly. Uh, as I understand it, um, you're looking to get it snug enough so that when the female loses a lot of her hair come summer, it's not just going to slip off, slip mm -hmm. off her head. And so, so I, I don't think we're anticipating to lose any, but you're right, Mike. I won't say it's impossible. It, it could totally happen. And if that happens... Uh, what we'll see on the computer is um, a mortality signal, which the mortality signal comes up when the collar stops moving. So as soon as it stops moving and it gets um, a few, I think if, I can't remember if it's set for 12 or 24 hours, but if the animal is in the same place for that long, it sends an alert. Um, so I, I have heard, and I believe this was actually one of Serge's stories, um, and it was either a moose or a caribou, uh, but they, they had an animal that kept pinging as a mortality. And every time they went out to check it, it was fine. Um, mm. <laughs> but yeah, so, so we do get alerts when animals stop moving. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be able to know um, whether, it's, whether it's time to investigate further. That, that leads to my next question, Holly. Um, um... Will, does the team conduct investigations if they continue, continue to see that 
a collared caribou is is continuing to not show movement yeah definitely um we're required under our permits to to investigate those situations um and and the reason that we do it is is because it contributes to our knowledge base for the species so you know um was the animal hunted was was it a predation event um was it some other kind of event that resulted in the mortality um so we we will be going out and conducting necropsies uh on the animals and uh doing site investigations to to help inform um the study because it is important to to understand um what's causing mortality to animals on the project in some cases it, it might be age we we collared a couple animals that were i think 10 years old um I mean, I, I hope all the caribou make it, but also, you know, wolves and wolverine and, and other scavengers need to need to exist too. So it's circle of life. Um, yeah. I got another one here for you, Holly, um, uh, about health and safety. Um, I know this is a big part of any of our field work, but what kind of precautions are taken um, as part of doing this? Because this is, you know, this is, this is quite an elaborate uh, effort here. Yeah, it was. And honestly, any program where you're using a helicopter is inherently dangerous. And then when I think you take off the doors and stick a person at the door, <laughs> there's the potential <laughs> to, to enter into more risk. Um, we were fortunate in, in bringing in Serge and Jean-Yves. They've worked together for so long and they've refined their safety protocol um, right down to every last little detail, like cleaning out the net guns and, and making sure that everything was in tip top shape because it's, it's performance. And, and I'm sure it's from lessons learned as well, like knowing that nothing can be in the cabin because the doors are open and you don't want materials flying out and compromising the helicopter. And so we like in preparing for this, <laughs> this work, you, you work through every single little detail and the health and safety plan, it's a living document. So we might be out there um, one day and something happens that we didn't think about. Well, that's, that's a conversation uh, for the evening, then the next morning, and then it's, it's not going back into the field until we've, we've resolved how we're going to address it safely. Um, so th yeah, there's, there's sure there's a lot of health and safety that goes into this. Yeah, I guess uh, one final question, Holly. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, what about the next steps in the survey program? Can you give us some details about that? Yeah, for sure. So um, we, w we will at some point be going through the data to, to see where the animals are at. I am personally very curious. Uh, c come next winter, we'll be doing a, a survey to, to count females and calves. So a calf recruitment survey, and that's just to kind of get an idea of how the population's doing uh, within the study area, within the range. Um, calf success kind of feeds into to where we see the population going and whether they're self-sustaining. Um, and then we, we don't anticipate putting out any more collars. We just anticipate following the ones that we have and, and seeing where those animals take us over the next three years. Excellent. Wow, good session, eh, Mike? Very good session. <laughs> Very good session. Wow, my head's going to explode. So much information. Uh, it's really, really good. Now, uh, Holly, thanks, thanks for joining us today. This was really, really interesting and informative. And, uh, you know, I think we need to keep uh, community members updated regularly on uh, on, on our work, especially these kinds of programs, because they're, I mean, they're important to community members. They're, they're a key species, as we talked about before. And, and, uh, and I think, I, I think it's just, it's just what we need to do. So um, keep those uh, photos coming, Holly, and, uh, and, we'll, you know, we'll try and get that information and those photos out there to, uh, to the community. Uh, um, Mike, uh, any uh, final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to share with us? Um, well, I guess maybe just 
next week, uh, please join us again here. Uh, same time, same day, um, May 5th from 6 to 7 uh, for the discussion of our upcoming um, uh, human impact assessment survey and a socioeconomic uh, uh, survey, I believe. And we'll see you then. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, thank you, Holly, for making time for us. And um, we look forward for more discussions uh, in the future. Thank you, Holly. Yeah. Thanks, guys. This was fun.